Now on to our last session, uh, of uh, last uh, speaker of this session, and I'm delighted to welcome one of our adjunct associate professors uh, to join us today. So Ian Power is the CEO of Community Creations, which is the not-for-profit company behind Spun Out, which is Ireland's Youth Information Service, and um, 5808, um, which is uh, a 24-7 tech support service. Um, Ian is also a member of the board of the Citizens Information Bureau and a member of the board of the Community Foundation for Ireland and has formerly served as the president of the National Youth Council of Ireland. So he's here to talk to us about the idea of creating research impact in service improvement. So Ian, I will hand over to you. Super. Thanks very much, Susie. Um, it's wonderful to, to be here this morning and uh, this afternoon with everybody um, and I think uh, Louise and David's presentations were very meaty. This is going to be a tasting assiette of a multitude <laughs> of different things um, and really the idea is to try and provoke uh, opportunities and connections as Eilish kind of set out for us at the beginning of the day in terms of how potentially um, your work can help create research impact in organisations like ours. Um, it spun out. And just a uh, content warning as well, there will be discussion of different topics, including suicide, self-harm, body image, and other issues that come up for our young people in Ireland. So um, just to give a, a sense of where we are, so we run a, a number of different um, services, all under the one umbrella and vision of an Ireland where all young people are empowered and supported to thrive. And we do that by working co-creatively with young people to design digital interventions that are going to support them um, and empower them. And really kind of the genesis of all of that has been over the past year kind of working with young people to understand what, you know, we talk about a lot of these issues in, in the abstract or um, we don't necessarily describe them in ways that are engaging. So this is something that we came up with um, within the Spunet community just to describe our story as what young people uh, and, and what we're experiencing on our, our journey through life and what we need and, and why we might need it. And I just bring your attention to the third last line there is if it matters to you, it matters to us, because one of the things that we've seen a lot from young people reaching out is feeling that they're not deserving of support or that their issue maybe isn't something that they need uh, or you know perhaps that there's somebody else out there who's de more deserving of support. And really what we're trying to say is yeah, rather than saying big and small, which is slightly subjective and pejorative, saying like, look, actually, Annie, whatever it is that you're going through, it matters to us and we want to help you support, uh, help support you through that. One of the ways that we do that is through our action panels. So we have uh, regional action panels based in, the, in five different kind of design regions across the country. Um, and they come together, they nominate young people to uh, a national action panel. And then the whole uh, action panel uh, nominates a uh, number of members of our board of directors and board subcommittees. So we try to make sure that the youth voice is present at every um, layer and every part of the organization. Really what we're trying to do, our intended impact ourselves, is that young people are empowered and informed through our information services, that they're heard and validated in the safe support spaces that we create through things like the texting service, and that we hopefully then navigate them to services that can help them in a, in a, a, a more systemic uh, um, way in terms of the issues that are going on for them, maybe specialist. Um, what we're trying to do really is create a funnel where we're a gateway to help seeking for young people to go on further to access other supports. So this is mostly how young people um, access our services um, on their phones. Uh, we produce uh, thousands of fact sheets. We've got, I think, 5,000 fact sheets, and then we have another few thousand lived experience pieces that help destigmatize um, and reduce isolation for young people experiencing particular issues. Social media obviously is a huge place and space where we work and um, trying to highlight awareness of issues that young people may not be already uh, aware that they might be experiencing, but not actually having a label or understanding what it is. And also as well, um, helping uh, again through that kind of lived experience voice, young people understand kind of, you know, different experiences, cognizant obviously that everyone's experience is going to be slightly different. Wanted to touch on this because this is a, an example of research impact. Um, so we would have worked very closely with Claudette Pretorius. I'm sure Manny would be familiar with her and her work under David Coyle. Um, and really kind of what Claudette helped us to do was, um, so folks might be familiar with Rick, Rick Wood's uh, help seeking um, model. And basically how do we interpret that in terms of how we pr present and provide information to young people in terms of understanding that there will be young people who will be completely unaware of something to young people who have lots of understanding are actually moving towards that help seeking piece so it's really small text but I'll, I'll share it obviously later but it just 
uh, it was really kind of operationalizing, for want of a better word, something that had been really well thought through from a, a theoretical perspective, but how do we put that into practice every day in our work? One of the other services, as I mentioned, is the texting service. So that's where we um, facilitate a connection between volunteers, often many of whom are younger, with younger texters, generally speaking. So about 75% of our texters are between the ages of 16 and 34. And really, it's an active listening service by text. Um, and it's trying to act as a safety net, particularly for young people between the hours of 9pm and 3am when other services may be closed. Uh, just to kind of uh, speak about risk briefly, so there's a, a lot of risk assessment process that we ask every texter if they've had any thoughts of, of suicide. Um, and this is where about 16% uh, reply in the affirmative. Um, and then we're able to um, de-escalate and support young people to safe plan, uh, safety plan and keep themselves safe. And then there's a, a, about 1% of conversations where we're engaging with the National Ambulance Service to try to protect uh, and keep somebody um, safe. So to date, we launched that service um, fully and publicly in the middle of the pandemic, so June 2020, but we had been running it in pilot, pilot form from September 2019. So we have 178,000 conversations done to date with about 5.7 million messages exchanged. So there's a lot of really rich data there, which is what I wanted to speak to you about. I'm going to fly through these, but this is just kind of a comparator between um, the ten months, first 10 months of last year and this year, and just means there's really re interesting kind of things to look at in terms of what, are, what, are, what is going on for texters and what's going on for young people in Ireland today. Um, most, of young, most of the people who use the service have heard through, of us through Google search, so they're actively looking for support, or maybe they're um, finding us through social media um, and from friends and family. The main reasons people text in is because they didn't have anybody else to talk to. They wanted to talk to somebody who didn't know them at all. They're more comfortable texting than they are um, talking. They don't have access to formal support. Um, uh, and that's kind of really the, the main drivers. Conversation length, mostly kind of in that hour range. Um, but obviously some of the higher risk conversations can go on for a longer period of time. Um, interestingly around um, three in five texters share something with their volunteer that they've never shared with anybody else, which kind of confirms to us that piece around that gateway to help seeking peace, where it's kind of opening up even if they don't have, it, often they describe not feeling comfortable or confident and having the literacy to talking about what what's going on for them with text, you kind of don't need to have that, which is, which is helpful. And then just about safety planning and, and their likelihood to follow through on that. So I just wanted to share a little bit of that, just to give you a sense of what the service is first before going into kind of what I see as some research opportunities and some stuff that we've done already. So obviously through um, my engagement here with UCD, we're, we're obviously really engaged with Youth Mental Health Lab and I'll describe one of the pieces of work we've done so far, the NSRF and UCC, the Insight for Centre for Data Analytics, um, and also the School of Psychology in UL. So one of the first things that was really, again, helpful for us is trying to understand there's all of these different modalities in terms of how you can provide information and interventions to young people, which is the most effective and actually which is the most effective in helping young people to retain that information as well. So we worked with Kira Nealon, um, uh, who was supervised by Eilish, looking at that um, and we did an experimental study. Um, and obviously the more interactive the content, the more uh, the information was retained. So we found that the quiz format was really effective and we've deployed that in some of the more kind of priority areas in terms of content across our website. This is a really interesting study. Uh, the paper was just published last week actually um, by the Insight Centre for Data Analytics in anyway, Galway. Um, so this was basically taking the Amoric surveys that Neffet were doing with the whole population and mapping it against the, tech, the data, data from our uh, tech service. And here you can see that there's a high correlation in terms of the number of conversations with the texting service and the mentions um, of COVID-19 in terms of the experience of anxiety in the Amoric study. Um, similarly, same was held true for worry and a number of other different um, experiences. And so really what that's telling us is that potentially there's a, an opportunity here to, to see the texting service as a real-time surveillance tool in terms of mental health issues for, for young people in Ireland. Another piece as well, really interesting study uh, done in UL by Dara Bradshaw, um, and actually a former staff member of ours, Alana Donnellan. Um, and really what that was looking for was, 
in terms of the volunteers, they're having these really difficult conversations. Obviously, we train them and we provide them with um, supervision support. We provide them with coaching support. But actually, how can we reduce burnout? How can we reduce um, any potential for vicarious trauma? And actually, what the, what this study kind of showed was that the best, the better and the more comprehensive you can kind of create a sense of community and connection to the mission of the organization, it's actually a really strong protective factor against those things, which we thought was really, really interesting. And then finally, um, loneliness is one of the top five issues consistently and isolation in terms of young people who are texting us. And we wanted to understand what's driving that for young people. Like there's, there's kind of a, a, a broader acceptance and understanding of loneliness and isolation in older people. And um, even though I think that's probably oversimplified, um, whereas there's not necessarily that same understanding in terms of younger people. So we wanted to, to kind of look at that. And really it was that sense of stagnation or perhaps not reaching life stages at times they perceive they should be reaching um, was kind of what was driving a lot of that, which was really, really interesting. So again, opportunities. Um, so we have a secondary data set. We have about 180,000 conversations uh, now with mostly young people. Uh, we've got that potential for real-time surveillance. We also run a, a survey, a post-conversation survey, which around 15% of texters complete. It's quite a long survey, but it gives insight into how they found the service, whether it was useful, their demographic data, other data as well in terms of things like adverse childhood experiences um, and other, other related um, interesting data points. Um, so we've got about 23,000 responses to that survey to date, which we can match to the actual conversation records that we've had um, uh, with the, the texter as well. So it, there's, there's another kind of survey that the volunteer completes to kind of categorize what the conversation was about. So it gives a huge amount of potential in terms of trying to understand um, aggregate trends in terms of, of youth mental health in Ireland. Um, and hugely uh, important as well sometimes is, is kind of really the sweet spot is where we can align a research interest with uh, the kind of service need to create a, a research question that will ultimately end um, in really effective um, and useful research impact for us as an organization and society generally. Um, one thing just to flag, we're currently um, amending, kind of are looking at our data points and, and what we might do for next year. So for example, there's an emerging um, piece of uh, evidence around um, uh, people. So we're, we're trying to pinpoint suicide risk as, as kind of precisely as we can in terms of our engagement with other services. And one thing that's emerging is that folks who mention that they're a burden um, as part of kind of their conversation, that that is actually a really high predictor of imminent um, imminent risk. Um, and that was something that we, we looked at uh, with Ruth Melia and UL. So that's something that we're going to be looking at. Do we add that into our ladder of risk assessment for next year? So if there's other things that people are thinking we should know about or that would be useful and evidence-based, um, there's an opportunity there for us to capture data. Um, just in terms of service quality and improvement, there's loads of these questions that we don't have the time to uh, even make a list of sometimes, um, let alone answer, nor do we necessarily have the skills to do that in-house. So uh, these are just some of Starter for Tens that, that we'd really love people if anybody's interested in, in helping us. And as I said, loneliness. Um, so the WHO has just designated it as a, a, a global health threat for young people. We, in, in terms of Ireland and European context, have some of the highest rates of, of youth loneliness. And um, so what is driving it and how can we address it? So what's next, just to give you a sense. So uh, really, we're trying to make text about it famous. We're trying to get it out there as much as possible. There's about a 20% penetration in terms of our tar target audience at the moment. So we'll be doing a lot of marketing um, from March of next year with a national campaign launching. Um, we're going to be launching something really interesting as well next year, which is a conversation simulator. So it's trained on the conversations we've had to date with young people in Ireland. But one of the things that we find is that volunteers, once they immediately graduate the training, they're incredibly risk averse. They're afraid to kind of develop their own tone of voice. And, and tone of voice is really what makes the difference in terms of building rapport with a texter in a text-based context. So we're building a simulator to allow them to practice on issues. So obviously suicide, having conversations with, about text, with texters about it is a really daunting thing. And so trying to give them the opportunity to practice on some of those 
um, real conversations almost that, that we've had with Texture previously um, is a really important kind of thing, not only for the volunteers' confidence, but it also directly correlates to whether or not textures rate that quality tech conversation as high quality or not. Um, the other piece is we're uh, just developing a self-directed learning portal as well for, for mental health kind of literacy and emotional regulation and kind of skills. Um, one of the things that young people have said to us is that information is great, it's really important, but we need to start learning the skills that we need to be able to deal with things um, that are coming up for us in our lives. So this is designed to be short, bite-sized, they can opt in and, and hop in and hop out um, as needed to, to access different um, courses. So again, there's a huge potential here in terms of measuring kind of learning outcomes, measuring distance traveled, all that sort of thing. Um, one of the things that we got funded to do in the last um in the budget for next year uh, it was one of the few things that we got in, in mental health is a dynamic signposting tool and this is something that um, david coyle is really leading in terms of developing the evidence base for things like this in terms of guided signposting and um, so helping young people to kind of set out what it is they might be looking for or, or kind of if they have some sense of what the issues are going on for them and connecting them as quickly as possible to the resources that might be helpful and crucially what we're hoping to do with this is not just have this as part of our service but multiple youth mental health services so that it's the standardized kind of um, information that uh, all young people are getting but there's a huge amount of work needed uh, to validate something like that and there's there's a lot of uh, interesting conversations then about can that be uh, a gateway to single point of access for youth mental health services as well and finally our goal over our, the next three years is to um, by 2027 have kind of an open source data repository that all of this information lives within the organization and um, we need to use it ourselves to improve our services but it needs to be also available to young people themselves to see that they're not the only young people going through the issues that they're experiencing and also policymakers to influence influence kind of um uh, change as well um, and there's a whole ton of different issues in terms of consent and ethics and everything else that goes into this um, and we do a lot around uh, making sure that the data is incredibly um, safe and secure. We only work with academic partners that we have formal agreements with um, and so UCD is one so this is a huge opportunity I think for, for us to, to kind of work together collaboratively. So yeah hopefully that was uh, uh, as I said a taster um, for what we can do together and yeah looking forward to the conversation at lunch. Thanks very much.